time, more than merrier. Now look at this longish one up there. You see that one with the cavity in the center? That's called the rastra or the speaking stage of ancient Rome. Now this was the speaking stage from where all the Caesars, Augustus, Cicero, before uh, BBC and CNN came in, that was the only source of communication. That's very busy stage. One man of great importance who went by the name Cicero would begin and end his career from this very speaking stage. Now Cicero was not a very humble upbringing. Have you heard about his name? Now, Cicero would, had such a uh, booming voice that he would model it so well that he would go on to attract, attract the attention and draw the attention of every possible Roman in this gathering. He goes on to become a magistrate, an advocate, a senator, and a counsel from this very speaking stage. But in later years, Mark Antony's wife would send her goons and she would pass orders that she would like to see the head and arms of Cicero on this very speaking stage without his torso. Two days, in 46 BC, somewhere in August, the Romans come to this very speaking stage and they see the head of their favorite speaker, Cicero, with his hands, and they also see that Mark and his wife had come up there, she would undo her hair, take her pin, and jab it through Cicero's tongue, sending out a message that if anybody was to speak against me, this would what would happen to him. Now she cuts off his hands because she says, the tools of his orator are his hands. They're more so with an Italian orator. If you'd walk the streets of Rome, you'd realize that Italians talk with their hands more than they talk with their mouth. They say if you were to tie an Italian hands behind his back, you can't talk too much. <laughs> Right. From this very stage, a very famous incident was created. Uh, history was rewritten. A man by the name Mark Antony would deliver a famous speech from this very stage. Heard about Mark Antony? Takes you back to Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar was assassinated by his 15 conspirators in a building five blocks in this direction. Now, I'll tell you a little in brief about Julius Caesar. Everybody comes to Rome and wants to know about Julius Caesar. Now, Caesar is going up to the Senate building in those days and he's, he's jumped off his chariot when he's met by a man who gives him a note which reads, Beware of the Ides of Mark Caesar, friends can turn foes today. But Caesar in such a daring hurry that takes his note, squashes it, puts it inside his toga pocket, keeps running inside the theater of Pompeii, where he takes his seat like you have taken a seat up here. He looks around, greets everybody with a smile, but then to his horror he realizes that he has been greeted by 15 deadly daggers. 15 deadly daggers held by 15 not so friendly senators. But then Caesar was a brave man. He was fighting them all in every direction possible. Until inside of one man makes him lose all hope. Who was that man? Brutus. Brutus. Right, right. He turns around, looks at Brutus, and makes a statement in the world as to not forgotten today. What did he say? And Probably you too, not. Brutus. You too, Brutus. Probably not. <laughs> he, because Caesar, Brutus did not speak English like you, me, and William Shakespeare. What do they speak in those days? Latin and Greek. So pain and agony on Caesar's face as he turns around, looks at Brutus, and he says, Tu quoqua fili me brute, which means, You also, my son Brutus. Historians say that Brutus was actually Caesar's adopted son. Now Caesar can't take it anymore. He falls down on his knees, covers his head with his toga, and accepts death like a brave, noble Roman soldier. But Brutus puts Caesar's body in a litter, brings it inside the Roman forum, puts it up on this parapet wall, on this wall up here, and goes on to deliver a very famous speech by trying to convince the Romans, saying that, hey Romans, I've got to confess, I killed Julius Caesar, but then hear me for my cause. It's not that I loved Caesar less, but then I loved Rome more. You see, I loved Rome more, and this man was a tyrant, a megalomaniac, and that's why I had to kill him. The, Brutus, the Romans are pretty much convinced that it was good to have killed Julius Caesar, but then Brutus would make a fatal error. He would turn around and look at a turn around and look at a bearded man in the backstage and tell him very sarcastically, "Hey, you, take center stage. Say a few good words about your dead friend Julius Caesar." This bearded man in the backstage supposed to be Mark, a very docile man, supposed to be a man who had no political ambitions whatsoever, who go on to deliver the most passionate speech in Roman history. What was this man's name? Mark Antony. Now everything falls into place. Now I would like to kind of recreate the speech very soon, not in, English, not in Latin but in English, telling you how passionate that speech was that was delivered by Mark Antony. Mark Antony says on that day, friends, Romans, countrymen, Lend me your ears, 
I come to bury Caesar, not to praise him. The evil that men do lives after them. The good is often done with their bones. So let it be with Caesar. The noble Brutus had told you that Caesar was ambitious. If it were so, it was a grievous fall. And previously would have Caesar answered. Under leave of Brutus and the rest, for Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. Come, I had to speak in Caesar's funeral. He was my friend, faithful and just to me. He had brought home to Rome many captives whose ransoms did the general coffers fill. Wouldn't this Caesar seem ambitious? When the poor had cried, Caesar had wept. Ambition should be made of sterner stuff. And Brutus says, Caesar was ambitious. And Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. You all saw in the Lupricum. I thrice presented Caesar with a kingly crown. Twice did Caesar refuse. Was this ambition? Caesar was ambitious. Brutus is an honorable man. So are they all, all honorable men. I speak not to disprove what Brutus spoke, but then here I am to speak what I do know. You all loved him once, not without cause. Then what cause would withhold you to mourn for him? Oh, judgment thou art. Flood to brutish beasts when men have lost their reason. Bear with me. My heart is in the coffin there with Caesar. And I must pause till it comes back to me. This was my rendition of Mark Antony's speech. <laughs> this is just the beginning of the tour, folks. But I'll tell you real quick, Mark Antony was supposed to be a good friend of Julius Caesar, but then it turns out that he was a better friend of Julius Caesar's girlfriend. That pretty young thing with a long nose from, uh, from North Africa, Cleopatra. He was vying for Cleopatra's attention. Now we're going to walk down in this direction. This is a free promotional tour. Uh, we are going to go up to the Senate House of Ancient Rome. You're all more than welcome to join us. No, no more speeches by from Shakespeare. Ja, det är allt jag kan lära flytta till honom. Det är Raida. Raida Raida. Lorenz Olivier har nu kanske gjort det bättre än. Ja, ja, det är allt jag kan sant. Så om vi Hann að búa að hérna aftur, hann segir okkur rögle eitthvað frá þessu eftir. Julia or the Senate House of Ancient Rome. Now this entire Senate House of Ancient Rome in marble, painted in bronze and gold, and right on the center of the triangle is top of the top, would have been a bronze eagle, the very same American bald eagle. So what in God's name was an American bald eagle doing on the top of a Roman Senate House? And what, is, what an eagle the Americans do? The symbol of freedom. To the, to the Romans in those days, the eagle was a symbol of victory. So every Roman legion is flat. Senate House, the Pantheon, every art would have had the same eagle on top. What is more interesting is that each side was 300 senators, and each senator had to sit or stand at one hand, one arm of the one arm's length to one another, probably not knowing no why, but taking back the ancient Roman tradition of maintaining the carmen inside the Senate house. 
But there was another point of time in history when there were only 299 soldiers in flight and they had a horse for a company. A horse! When and who's going to get a horse get in there? Very right. There was an emperor who made his horse as a tabula, as a, as a council. In simpler terms, let's keep it with Caligula. Caligula was an emperor so twisted, so senile, that he would actually insist that his horse join him for dinner every single night. Invitation for state banquets were sent out in the name of the horse. And one fine day, what do you hear? The horse gets elected as a senator inside. One about the state of mind of Caligula, and second, what Caligula thought about the senators in the assembly. He created them to horses. And the horse would be tied to a wooden post, 